Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea Dumitrașcu. I'm part of the Connect University team, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the second week of the Connect University Summer School 2021 on Digital for Our Planet. Over 9,000 registrations from more than 70 countries across the globe, 16 inspiring sessions, where 80 experts are explaining how can digital technologies be used to tackle climate change, both in terms of a greener digital system, as well as their role in helping reducing carbon emissions across industries. All the events are recorded and can be reviewed afterwards, either directly on the Digital EU YouTube channel or on the, or, or on the Connect University uh, webpage in the video section. You can still register for the following sessions. Uh, the links will be published soon on Slido. And also uh, don't forget about the certificates that uh, you can get if you join more than seven lectures. Uh, for today's event on digital for circular economy and zero pollution, we invite all of you to join us via Slido using the code circular economy. I repeat the code for Slido is circular economy. You can comment and ask us questions and we will allocate them accordingly to our speakers. Also, please use the hashtag ConnectUniversity when sharing insights on the event on social media. Without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome Joachim de Eugenio, DG Environment from the Unit Quality of Life, European Commission. Yeah, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having this whole summer school. Uh, fascinating uh, set of events. And this afternoon, we're going to dig a bit deeper in, in some concrete applications or areas of work that we are doing uh, from the side of the European Commission, but also, of course, a lot with uh, many, many people out there, member states, uh, research institutes and, uh, and and many others, businesses are getting more and more involved. And I'm very happy to kick off this session with a, give, uh, with a bit of an overview. My presentation is covering two parts. Then I should say that uh, the first part is uh, has been prepared and should have been provided by William Neal, my colleague, uh, who was unfortunately not sure whether he could make it this afternoon. So I have uh, agreed that I would um, take his part as well. And we're doing all this in close collaboration with many colleagues in, in DG Connect. So this is very much a joint effort. Now let's go straight into it. Um, the slide is showing you the European Green Deal. And I think you are by now aware of the headline ambition and the headline priority of the European Commission. Uh, the European Green Deal, which we are, of course, implementing in the various thematic areas. And as you see here, this is the announcement, the slide is from the announcement uh, of uh, the president in 2019 when the European Green Deal was presented. And in the meantime, we have basically filled all the circle or, or completed all the thematic strategies. Obviously, we have been uh, very busy and are still very busy on, on, on the climate agenda. We have worked on biodiversity and many other aspects. Uh, but I want to zoom in today a little bit in more detail economy part and uh, the clean and circular economy uh, action plan that was adopted last year and the implementation that we're doing there with particular relevance to the digital agenda and the uh, zero pollution action plan for air, water and soil, which is part of the zero pollution ambition. And that was adopted uh, very recently in May 2021. And again, I will just focus a little bit there on the um, digital dimension, the digital component. And as you will see, both are also very much uh, intertwined. So I think it's good to, to discuss them uh, together. Uh, let's start with the Circular Economy Action Plan. In uh, 2020, in, in March, when we presented the action plan, it included, it was the second action plan, I should say, and it includes uh, 35 actions along uh, the entire life cycle of products. So we have, on one hand, the ambition to make a product sustainable and have that the norm, not the exception. We want to empower consumers and public buyers. 
and the action plan is very much uh, for the first time looking at key product value chains and the ICT electronic sector is one of these value chains but for instance textiles, plastics, uh, vehicles, batteries uh, and there are a few others you can see them all listed here um, these are really as, as the focus now of the second uh, circular economy action plan it is of course clear that with all the actions we want to reduce waste overall and make circularity work for people, regions, and cities. And in that respect, this is not only a European effort, but also a global ambition that we are now discussing more and more with our partners. And we have more and more countries joining the alliance uh, that we have set up since the action plan was adopted. In order to discuss a bit more the, the specific digital aspects and dimension, I want to focus this presentation very much on the, uh, on the, on the sustainable products initiative and on the digital product passport. And uh, the sustainable product policy is something that we are currently developing. It is something that will come up with a number of uh, different initiatives packaged together uh, towards the end of the year. And it will, of course, look at products to improve their durability, reusability, upgradability, and repairability as well as try to reduce and address the, um, the presence of, of hazardous chemicals. So the pollution aspect is a very important part there as well already uh, to, uh, to increase the recycled content. I mean, the cleaner a product is, the easier it can be recycled and reused. Um, we want to basically counter premature obsolescence, meaning that, that single use is again becoming more the, the uh, exception of the rule. And uh, there are, should also be incentives for product as a service. And in that respect, I mean, you can already see, and you will see in, in, in other presentations later, uh, the digitization will be a very important um, component and enabler to help us achieve that. When looking now into the uh, product uh, chain, the, uh, the consumption production chain, a bit more detail, this is already very detailed, but it's also relatively high level. And I'm not going to go through all and every part of the of this slide, uh, but what I wanted to um, mention and, and illustrate here in particularly that we are, we're going, of course, from the production, from the materials that we're using uh, to the consumption part. We're going through a whole value chain where we have uh, product manufacturers, parts manufacturers, service providers, and where we have, of course, several uh, several pathways which we would like to make circular and which in the past or currently are still uh, very much uh, linear. And for all of this, for all of these circles that you see here, I think it is important that we have data available. Data and knowledge and sharing these data and knowledge is pretty much uh, uh, essential uh, to get us from, which is here on a more detailed slide, from a, a linear economy, which basically has the materials used as part of a product then there may or may not be any repair, but at some point we, we reach obsolescence. We have uh, basically uh, relatively short lifespans from a lot of products that we're still using. And we're taking basically all this material out of the economy. So we are, of course, trying to change this by enabling more repair, more re manufacturing, recycling, and so on and so forth, so to keep these products into the uh, value chain as long as possible. And to illustrate a little bit what we're dealing with here is uh, some figures on some ICT products uh, and their average lifetime from a study from 2018. And uh, linked to that is also the uh, embodied carbon footprint and the en energy consumption. And of course, if you, for example, have smartphones or tablets uh, that last only between three or four years, then that has a, has a huge impact um, on the overall uh, embodied uh, carbon footprint. And so the aim is really to find ways, not only for this product types, but also for others to expand uh, the life cycle. Uh, if you look here in this slide, the, uh, the information flow, the data flow in a linear economy is very nicely illustrated. Obviously, we have a different uh, production manufacturing steps. And a lot of these data that are um, they're available, generated, and known about uh, the, the material and the product are not passed on, at least not in their entirety, through the value chain. Some of that is uh, confidential, some for good reasons, others for uh, probably 
reasons that we cannot address or, or things that we cannot overcome. Uh, there is often also a non-standardized information flow, in particular when it comes between uh, producers and consumers. And we also have a lot of information that is lost, uh, in particular towards the end, which by the time when a product arrives at the recycler, there is very little information that would allow the uh, service provider, the recycler, actually to know, can we recycle this? How can we repair this? How can, what can we do with that material? because all of that information got lost along the way, which is why we have now engaged into a uh, initiative that colleagues are working on uh, tirelessly to set up as part of the sustainable product policy, and this is the so-called digital product passport. If I'm not mistaken, we will hear more about some examples and more details on that later. But what is it that we are trying to achieve? Uh, on one hand, we want to establish very clear rules so that the data are collected in a structured way, that the access rights are clear, and that we have a unique identifier so that the information can be passed on. Um, we have uh, the idea that this is, of course, not a centralized, cannot be a centralized system. So we want to work with the uh, initiative that we have been presenting also over a year ago on the European data spaces, and here in particular the part which has uh, got the name uh, European Data Space for Smart and Circular Applications, um, to basically allow data sharing in a decentralized manner. I'll come to that a little bit later in my presentation at the end. And we want to cover, of course, information linked to sustainability, uh, circul circularity, and all the other aspects that I've mentioned. So this is one part of the work that we're doing in relation to circular economy, and now a few words about um, zero pollution. Uh, the action plan and uh, the uh, kind of the ambition is something that we have uh, spelled out uh, in, in, our, um, in our communication back in, in May. And the action plan looks very much into improving health and well-being, looking at pollution and biodiversity, and looking at pollution and uh, consumption and production. And for all of that, we have, of course, very strong policies uh, in place. But we are trying to bring these together and see how we can actually combine their effects by also using some of these powerful enablers, whether it is um, the better implementation of, uh, of our policies and, and, and legislation that exists, or whether it is uh, boosting uh, change across society, for example, through digitization. And that's what I want to focus on. Uh, just to give you a flavor of what that vision is, so alongside the climate neutrality, we have set out for 2050 that we want pollution levels for air, water, and soil to be considered no longer harmful to health and the natural ecosystems and respect the boundaries of our planet uh, and, and the boundaries that the planet can cope with. So I think that's a very ambitious and long-term uh, objective, which is very much also linked to the ambition in the circular economy. And for that, and that's what I wanted to zoom into, we have set out uh, action areas where we believe digitization can play a very important role. There is actually a staff working document, which you can easily find um, if you look for digital solutions for zero pollution. And you see the reference on the slide. And in that, in that we have uh, identified more than 25 uh, case studies and use cases where we basically show that digitization is already helping a lot in the reduction of pollution of smart mobility, for example, of using uh, better digital solutions for farming and aquaculture. When we monitor our soil pollution or when we have water management or marine protection management being implemented uh, in practice. And we think that these examples are showing that digitization is a very good integrator. It can basically be used to uh, bridge between the environmental ambition and the sector specific, the economic sector uh, activities. And for that, I think there is a window of opportunity that we would like to promote also with uh, uh, the discussions that we're having uh, today. Uh, one example I already mentioned is, uh, is the water sector, the water sector being uh, extremely uh, keen on using sensors, big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence to optimize the service provision of drinking water and urban wastewater, for example, or sewage treatment, uh, but also to, to have all our water management, whether it's floods or droughts, uh, 
uh, all of this uh, can be connected together and the new tools with uh, remote sensing, earth observation, uh, have given us a new uh, powerful set of, uh, of, of tools uh, that can make our policies more effective and more uh, implementable on the ground, which is why the data spaces that I've mentioned earlier are so important, and I'm coming so, uh, slowly to an end of my presentation. Um, so the data spaces are an initiative that uh, the Commission has launched already as part of the data strategy in February 2020, and we are now implementing it through a variety of initiatives and will use, of course, uh, the Digital Europe program to, to help uh, provide some initial seed funding uh, in order to get this off the ground. And another uh, headline project is the so-called Destination Earth, which is aiming to develop a digital twin of the Earth. And again, we can discuss that more later. The data spaces are divided into many thematic areas, and you see here highlighted the Green Deal part, so the environmental climate part, as part of a wider set of data spaces. They should all be interoperable. Data should be available between these sectors for, for reuse, and there should be some horizontal rules in place and an overarching governance, and of course, all the IT and digital uh, agenda, whether it is uh, uh, new high-performance computing uh, or artificial intelligence, Will come, will come basically as an underpinning infrastructure to help us achieve that. What I've mentioned earlier, the smart and circular, um, circular uh, data space uh, is part of the Green Deal data space as mentioned here. Which uh, leads me to conclude that we believe that the digital and green solutions are a, a, a huge business opportunity as well, both for circular economy and for zero pollution. Uh, they cannot actually be separated. There are, there are so many good ideas already out there that can be mainstreamed and can be further uh, accelerating the, the green uh, transition. And I conclude with uh, a number of recommendations that you will find also in the paper that I've mentioned, is that in order to do so, we have really a window of opportunity now in the coming years, uh, starting with the resilience and recovery uh, financing that is now being started to, to be used both at European and national level, but also with other investment opportunities with the transitions that we are developing. And we believe one of the recommendations is that we really need to embrace the twin digital and green transition. We should create multiple benefits. A lot of green investments are taking place and they all have a digital component. So how can we maximize the benefits uh, from those? We need to modernize uh, environmental administrations, for example, or ensure that we have enough digital skills and capacities and invest in, so to, so to say, in the, in the human capital, and we need to open up data. So these are just some of the recommendations that you find in, in more detail in, in the paper. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the presentations and the discussions because a uh, discussion like today is really essential for us to not only get the message out, but to involve and enthuse and inspire as many people as possible because we really, over the next decade, it's the key decade for, for achieving what we have set out uh, from the Euro European Commission as part of the European Green Deal. The next decade will allow us to uh, transform our societies into a, green, into a greener way of doing things by using digital as one of the key uh, drivers for that uh, positive green transition. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I hand back to Andrea. Many thanks for the very interesting presentation. Um, I see on the slide though that uh, there are some participants uh, encountering a few issues with uh, with the audio. Maybe you can check uh, to to watch it directly on uh, on YouTube. On our side, we are doing our uh, uh, best to 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 solve this. Uh, and indeed, I can also confirm that uh, all the, the materials will be published uh, very soon on the Connect University webpage, where uh, you will be able to, to download them and also to, to watch the recording as of uh, the next uh, day. Um, so uh, without uh, further ado, then I would uh, uh, allow uh, you, Joachim, to, to, to introduce uh, the, the next uh, speaker uh, and uh, continue, continue the session.
Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, and I'm really delighted that uh, a colleague of ours that we've started working with some, some years ago when we started thinking about the green and digital agenda has uh, had time in his busy schedule to, to join the session this afternoon. So I welcome uh, David Jensen, the head of uh, digital transformation at UN Environment. And David has been working on, on the global dimension of all of this and has been liaising with us very closely. And, uh, and will now present a little bit in more detail the work that he is uh, involved in and that he's doing uh, in, in the context of circular economy and zero pollution. David, you have the floor. Great, thank you so much, Joachim. Just want to do a sound check and video check. Is everything loud and clear? You can see everything? Yes? Yes, we can. Great, thank you so much. It's a real delight and pleasure to be here. I'm not only um, presenting today, but I'm also taking uh, many of the classes myself, I'm, and I'm finding a lot of the content extremely useful, and it's just been a really fantastic summer school. So I wanted to congratulate everybody involved in, in a lot of the production and all the great set of speakers you've brought together. So I wanted to talk uh, a little bit more about the digital technologies we can be using to accelerate a, a circular economy and this drive towards uh, zero pollution. I want to give examples and talk a little bit about UNEP's work, but not exclusively about UNEP's work. So let's just go back to first principles very quickly. What is a circular economy? I find it interesting to think, you know, to realize that this actual concept dates back to the 1970s. So it's not actually a, a new concept. Uh, it's actually quite old, but it hasn't really achieved the kind of speed and scale we would have liked until recently. So. What, what are the three core ideas if you really unpack it? The, the whole thing is about shifting to a, knee, a new economic system uh, with three major elements, right? A system where we regenerate our natural uh, systems and natural resources, where we design out waste and pollution, and fundamentally where we keep products and materials in use and in this, in this idea of a, you know, in circulation for, for much, much longer. So those are the kind of the three pillars of the circular economy. But, but it's actually much more than that. It's also this mindset shift from this idea of kind of linear extractive thinking to more circular regenerative, think regenerative thinking. And if, if you take a look at the sort of the linear economy, there's a very nice acronym, which is sort of take, make, use, lose, which is the current mindset. And as Joachim mentioned, the circular economy uh, is much different. It's take, make, consume, use, regenerate, restore. Um, so it's a much more circular idea with, as he said, feedback loops, uh, and the idea is really to regenerate and restore uh, natural resources and to, and to recapture as many resources in the system as possible. Part of it is also about mimicking natural systems and sort of copying nature in biomimicry, and part of it is shifting business models uh, from the physical ownership of products towards pay-for-use services. Uh, this is also called products as a service business model. So there's a, a number of ideas in, in the background here. So why is this even more relevant today than it was in the 1970s? Well, I think everybody understands that there's this massive reliance on digital infrastructure. By the end of next year, something like 60% of, of global GDP will be digitalized. And this is uh, one of the major impacts of this is e-waste, for example. 53.6 uh, million tons of, of e-waste was produced in, in 2019. This is equivalent to around 125,000 Boeing 747 jets, which is more than all of the commercial airlines ever created. It's a huge amount of waste. Um, it's the fastest growing domestic waste stream. And only about 17.4% of e-waste uh, in 2019 was actually collected and recycled. Only 78 countries have e-waste legislation. So the more we digitalize, the more we have to deal with this e-waste problem and the more that circular economy can help that. But that's not the only thing, right? There's also the fact that we now have 4 billion people online being influenced by about 20 companies. Um, and, and that's, you know, the way that they are being influenced in terms of their consumption is uh, something we need to be aware of and we need to be directing those 4 billion people towards more sustainable products, lifestyles, and behaviors. 2 billion of those people are already consuming on e-commerce on e platforms and the rest are coming online very quickly. And I think the concern about those 2 billion is that most of the social uh, media platforms that are out there, they're using business models which really amplify the seven deadly sins. And we need to be asking, right, are those the values we want to be amplifying in the digital economy? Or do we want to amplify other values like sustainability, regeneration, circulator, et cetera? I think 
I think we know the answer to that. But the question is, how do we begin to bring those other values into the digital economy at the algorithmic level? So I think the, the real risk is that digitalization will actually lead to more consumption, not less. And as we connect half the planet to the digital economy, as we close this digital divide, we need to be thinking about, you know, how do we do that in an environmentally sound way? How do we avoid major uh, impacts from energy? How do we uh, how do we avoid exacerbating e-waste and supply chain impacts? So it's it's obviously very relevant. And, and as I said, it, it's an old concept, the circular economy, um, and it's faced a whole series of technical barriers to implementation until now. I would argue, I would argue in the last, let's say, five years, all the technology that's now available can really start to enable the circular economy at a global scale and at a speed that's that's really never been seen before. And I think, you know, I just wanted to unpack sort of what those barriers have been that, that have prevented this concept from, from scaling. So the first is that there is a need to measure sustainability performance across the full supply chain of a product, and that's proven to be difficult. There's a need to track and trace materials across uh, the life cycle of products, also difficult. There hasn't been in place kind of the digital infrastructure that we've needed to really manage this kind of data at scale uh, and across multiple user groups. We haven't had the ability to really monitor and model complex human natural systems at a global scale and to really assess in real time the policy impacts uh, of our work. And so that has been a major barrier. We haven't had the tools to, to engage really in eco-design uh, to reduce waste and achieve modularity and upgradability. We've lacked circular economy business models to shift from these products to services. We haven't had the tools again to, to enable product comparability and to enable consumers to really assess the performance of different products and services. And we haven't really had in place the, the, the infrastructure uh, for peer-to-peer -peer exchange for sharing and, and reparation of products. So I think those are all the barriers we have faced in, 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 in scaling this idea, and every single one of those can now be addressed. So that's the good news of the presentation. And for the rest of the presentation, I just wanna basically give you one example on how each of these barriers to uh, a circular economy is now basically being lifted through digital technologies. Now, before I get into those, those eight use cases, let me just say that what's at stake here uh, is, is a massive increase in our ability to decarbonize, to dematerialize, and to detoxify every product or service in the economy. And if we look across the main sectors, from information to food to transport to energy to materials, we're looking at decarbonization gains anywhere from, from 10 to 20 percent, uh, detoxification somewhere between 100 to 100, sorry, 10 to 100 times less waste, and in terms of dematerialization up to a 90 percent reduction through the use of, of a range of digital technologies. So the stakes are very high and the potential impact is, is potentially huge. So let's walk through those different barriers and just talk very briefly about examples of how these are now being lifted. So if we look at food waste, for example, food waste is about a third or sort of a third of all food goes, goes to waste each year, which is about 8% of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. If we start to embed sensors across the food supply chain, um, we can begin to reduce waste anywhere from 25 to 40%, uh, which is absolutely phenomenal. And, and there's a whole series of, of uh, sensors that can really enable us to, to detect waste and to prevent it um, in real time. So that's one example of you know, being able to now track the, the, the environmental or the sustainability performance across the life cycle and really reduce that waste load. The second idea is sort of tracking and tracing of materials. If you look at something like copper, for example, copper is absolutely key in most information and communication technologies and in all of the renewable energy products. Um, a wind turbine, for example, uses about 3.6 tons of copper per megawatt, and a Tesla uses around 80 grams uh, per car. So it's indispensable uh, you know, for the digital economy and, and for uh, green energy. Um, copper dem demand at the moment is rising. It's about 5% per year. Uh, which is outstripping the supply, which is around 2.3 to 2.5% uh, per year. So obviously we need more supplies uh, coming online and we need to really amplify our ability to recycle what we have. So the, the Internet of Things, IoT and blockchain are, are currently being explored to start to uh, enable the tracking and tracing of copper across the entire value chain uh, to enable recovery and recycling. And these, these uh, technologies can both record 
um, the performance standards of copper. So how was copper actually produced? How much CO2 was emitted? What kind of toxic chemicals were used as it was produced? As well as record the chain of custody as it moves across, uh, as it's transformed across the value chain. So blockchain can really start to re uh, record both of these and really enable um, tracking across the value chain and recovery. And Rio Tinto, for example, is now is really pilot testing, you know, how to do this all the way from um, production to the consumption uh, of the of the copper life cycle. So there's a lot of opportunity now to begin tracking and tracing different materials and really uh, recovering them much more systematically. Now, I find this particular one fascinating, right? The digital infrastructure for data sharing and processing. And what you have to get your mind around is sort of a graphic like this. The more we move into a circular economy, every step of that value chain is going to produce data. So for every product loop, there's a product data loop. Uh, and that is going to be a huge amount of data that we need to be managing, right? So we need data protocols and standards to store that data from multiple sources, to control the quality of that data. And as Joachim mentioned, to really manage the access to that data, right? Business to, business to business access, business to government access, and business to consumer access. All will need uh, different uh, access protocols. We'll have to monitor uh, the, the product across the life cycle, and we'll have to generate analytics on it. So there's going to be a massive increase in data. This is an example of a, of a battery, uh, a circular battery lifestyle. I just put it up there briefly. Each one of those check marks is a different data point that needs to be managed as that, uh, as that battery moves into sort of a circular economy mode. So exponential increase in data and need for this kind of digital infrastructure. And this is where we have standards like what's called GS1 starting to really begin to embrace the whole circular economy concept all the way from sort of the manufacturer to the end consumer. Um, and what's interesting, of course, with GS1 is, is this revolution in terms of this, what's called the digital link. Basically, all of the GS1 standards are now being sort of integrated and made into this digital link, which will enable products, uh, every product, to basically have this live data about its supply chain uh, and enable to, or, or these products can contain information from multiple users and they're going to be in, in an interoperable format. So the potential here is, is really transformative. And this, this is kind of the underpinning of the digital archi ar architecture that would then be needed for this digital product passport that Joachim mentioned. So I find this particular, um, this particular digital uh, innovation and really revolutionary in terms of being able to then collect all this data and, and begin to use it uh, for decision-making by, by consumers. The fourth idea that we need uh, for a digital, uh, uh, sorry, for a circular economy, we need to be taking all that data and really begin to do planetary scale monitoring and modeling, right? Does it, is this making any difference at a planetary scale? So how do we begin to integrate all of those individual uh, product loop data points into a global view? Um, how do we begin to model it? And how do we begin to use digital twins, as Yoki mentioned, and API data families uh, to make sense of that data? And what's, again, fascinating, you can now use, for example, Earth observation satellites uh, to begin to monitor, for example, microplastics uh, in the oceans. This is a short uh, video just to show you, um, you know, the movement now of microplastics uh, in near real time through, through uh, remote, sensing, remote sensing imagery. So we begin to see, you know, are the policies uh, that we're implementing for, for a circular economy actually having the kind of impact uh, we want and we, begin, we can begin to do that kind of processing at a global scale, which is really um, unheard of. We can also begin to take uh, sensors nationally and do the same thing. This is, for example, a real-time uh, map of air pollution. That's an aggregation of multiple, you know, thousands of sensors on the ground. We begin to integrate all that and construct these global monitoring platforms to really uh, assess the impact of our policies at a global or real-time level. Fifth is moving into this whole idea of uh, digital eco design. How do we design products and services uh, using artificial intelligence, for example? And as we know, like waste and pollution are not accidental. They're, they're consequences of real decisions made during product design. About 80% of the environmental impacts of a product are determined in this design process. And so we can begin to use artificial intelligence, for example, to do better designs faster. We can adjust designs. We can sort of analyze 
um, uh, scenarios and, and begin to use AI to suggest design improvements and design adjustments. And a, a good example comes out of the European Space Agency, for example, they have this project called Accelerated Metallurgy, where they're using AI to redesign space metals, right? They're trying to redesign space metals in a non-toxic way that can be reused, that have longer use periods. And what they're finding is that an AI-based design process is around a thousand times faster than con conventional methods, which is obviously an exponential increase in their ability to do this kind of eco-design. Other examples look at sort of modularity, right? How do we take, uh, for example, ICT and make these products more modular? And this has sort of two benefits. Um, modularity enables uh, basically faster customization, and it also enables more repairability, upgradability, and the ability to remanufacture those products. And just a good example of, you know, how modularization improves the ability to remanufacture those products, Xerox did this, this uh, uh, comparison of a non-modular versus modular copier, and it found that the, you know, the, the savings doubled, uh, this, the, sorry, the materials consumption savings doubled when they used a more modular approach. The sixth area is, is new business models, right? How do we create new business models moving from sort of products to services? You may have heard about this, this revolutionary platform uh, called Loop, uh, recently launched in 2019, where a whole series of manufacturers and retailers are, are coming together to try to eliminate, completely eliminate single use packaging. Uh, so there's a whole, there's a whole uh, circular uh, system here where they're trying to completely eliminate packaging and, and, and uh, basically uh, refill uh, these, these products and services uh, to take to t completely eliminate uh, plastics. And obviously this is a collaborative effort across multiple companies. And this is something to definitely uh, watch for. Another company that's uh, doing something similar, they're using RFID uh, chips and, and IoT capabilities to begin to basically uh, monitor individual containers and to begin to uh, recharge those containers when they're finished. Basically, customers have an app. When they finish their particular product, they can basically just call for a recharge. You have this little uh, scooter bike uh, that comes to your house and does uh, a refill of all the products that you potentially need. You can also go to a refill station, a grocery store, or various kiosks. And what they do is they're offering about 12% you know, savings when you use this system. So far, it's being uh, pilot tested in Chile in about 2,000 shops. Uh, it's been servicing about uh, 350,000 people. Um, and the amount of plastic saves is uh, you know, near about 40,000 uh, kilograms. So again, new ways of trying to uh, make circularity and, and take waste out of the system. A couple more examples and I'll finish up. Uh, as I mentioned, um, one of the key things is helping consumers take better decisions and really being able to compare the, the performance of different products they're buying. And so we've got a lot, an explosion of examples uh, to enable this kind of uh, product comparability. This is one platform that's being stood up uh, by the government of Chile to really enable comparison of, across different products. We have another uh, emerging standard or another emerging product, or sorry, STAMP, which is the digital with purpose movement. And this is trying to really calculate you know, the, the individual performance of, of, of ICT products with respect to their um, ESG goals and also their commitments to sustainable development goals, providing this uh, numeric stamp in terms of how far they are along that, that transformation uh, chain. And finally, we have uh, digital platforms that are now creating new marketplaces for sharing. I think everybody is familiar with, uh, with eBay and other platforms like that, but What's the impact of that in terms of, uh, in terms of circularity? There was a study recently done um, where they looked at 10 different marketplaces to really understand you know, how much material was being saved through sharing. And the, the, the results were very impressive. It's 20 million tons of CO2 in one year, um, which is about the equivalent of a, like almost half of Norway's annual emissions, for example. Um, and really trying to sort of quantify what were the other effects, you know, in terms of aluminum recycling, in terms of steel, in terms of plastics. So they quantified systematically what the effect has been in terms of the sharing economy and found some very dramatic uh, savings. And of course, this, the sharing economy and digital platforms also create are also enabling really uh, products to be repaired uh, through through peer to peer uh, reparations, for example. And and again, uh, with some really impressive uh, results. Now, of course, final couple slides, um, the digital, the, the, the circular economy 
uh, also has some challenges we have to think through, right? Infinite recyclability isn't possible. R materials degrade over time and they require energy to, be, to reprocess. So there will always need to be some level of, of additional materials added. Generally speaking, there is, if you look at sort of all the types of, of consumer products, there's around 650 types of waste that are generated and consumers really can't separate kind of this level of volume. So we need to figure out, you know, how do we deal with that kind of separation of, of, all, those, of all those waste streams? Uh, durability can be hard to estimate. There's been a trend in the ICT space to move towards more integration of circuits rather than modularity and how do we deal with that? Um, the ease of online shopping can result in consuming more, not less. Digital marketing can consumer can encourage more, not less. And you've got rebound effects to deal with. A drop in prices can really increase consumption as well. So we need to be thinking about how do we deal with some of these issues as we take it forward. Final slide is our work. What are we doing uh, to enable this? So we have a new program on, on digital transformation that was approved only in February. And we're looking at a number of ways to really uh, provide assistance to the digitalization of the circular economy. First and foremost is the provision of global environmental data and standards. The second is looking at this whole question of life cycle assessment and how can we begin to digitalize LCA processes. The third is again, looking at this question of durability, reuse, repair. We're looking at eco labeling and consumer and, and communicating to consumers with digital uh, labels and digital product passports. Um, working with governments on sustainable uh, public procurement, and then finally working across different applications uh, where we can begin to look at use cases and, and values. So looking at textiles, buildings, cities, and SMEs. I will stop on that uh, final slide and, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, David. Uh, very uh, comprehensive and you covered a lot of ground and I see there's already uh, questions coming in. Um, and if you want to join the chat basically to, to reply to some of them, I would propose that we keep the questions for the end because we have uh, still three very interesting presentations and uh, we uh, are running a little bit behind time. So without uh, further ado, I would like to go to our next speaker and that is Francesca Poggialli. She's public director for, uh, for policy director Europe for GS1 Global Office and has done a, a lot of work in the field of uh, corporate uh, social responsibility and is particularly now looking at uh, digital for green and green for digital with the question of how can we make sure that this doesn't increase our uh, carbon footprint, so to say. So I hope that uh, Francesca is connected and is ready to go. And thank you. Thanks a lot. Help her as well, please. Yes. Thank you, and thanks a lot for setting this up. It's tremendous. I'm so excited to be with you today. And thanks for setting up this uh, summer university. It's very, very, very important. I'm learning a lot as well. And thanks also to David who made um, you know, the speech before me, because he already mentioned the GS1 Open Standards. I've seen RFID also copied in his slides. So I'm very happy. My job is easier now. <laughs> and I hope I'm um, let me just share my, my presentation. Uh, and I'm sure you can see it. I'm putting it in, in presentation mode right now. So that I will introduce this one a little bit just at the beginning because not everybody is familiar with our organization. So just one is a global standard organization and it is present in 150 countries. In Europe, we are present in G20 Europe, which represents 49 countries. For those of you who are more curious about our standards, I can say that the G1 standards are ISO standards, if you want to find a comparison, but with a focus on product on product identification, data sharing, and data capturing. Really, you can uh, you know, hear the beep beep and think of us. This is about the barcodes that are scanned daily all over the world. Companies, more than 300 companies use the G1 standard, and we are a, a company driven standardization body. So, I hope with this, I gave you an overview of what we are doing. We think that the G1 standards enable better consumer experiences and fashion safety. We, the standards are used in more than 30 different sectors, and over the years, we've been building 
a common language to enable B2B, B2C, B2G communication. As I said, we have several best practices. Of course, the healthcare sector has been champion in using the CSCON standards over the years. And so this has been really, really very informative also for the other sectors. So for instance, let me go more into the details. In healthcare, serialization is already used. And maybe serialization is one of the topics that we will take today. If I take what Joachim and David already presented on the circular economy. My task for, with you today is trying to find a way on how to meet the circular economy challenges and to support companies driving the change and developing digital twins in a way that it is not going to create more environmental impact than, than the one that we are trying to tackle. Because as David said, the amount of data that will be generated that is already generated and unfortunately gets, gets lost partially today, we need to find a way to use the data and to produce data and to structure data in a meaningful way along the circularity model. And the G1 Open Standard, they help identifying, capturing, and sharing product data information. We've been doing this. The standards have been really active already in the last 50 years. But of course, they were born for logistic purposes. They were born to, you know, to uh, enable communication along the supply chain. And our purpose initially was to identify products in order to facilitate the discussions between the manufacturers and the retailers along the supply chain. But supply chains are very complex. As, you, as it was already said, there are a lot of stakeholders that are, of course, involved in linear supply chains. And we also see the limitations of what um, of, of the way the linear supply chain can handle the data and structure the data. This is why we also made our homework and we are trying to embrace the circularity through our standard suite. And here, in, I know it's a lot of information in one slide, but here you can see actually all the GS1 standards that are available. The GS1 standards are open standards. And so really um, the IP policy of GS1 is published on our website both at national level or a global level. And, and so you will see that our standards have the potential to enable the data disclosure in a common way, which means to enable also the circularity and the data that is produced and the way it is structured and the way it is maintained happens without having a bigger environmental impact than, than what we are trying to say. Because this is also what is at stake. We need to consider the green ICT values and principles. I've heard David before speaking about the values that are behind the circularity. For us, the most important one, the key word, the key message that I want to share today is that all these standard suites that you see on the screen enable interoperability. And I guess interoperability is what is really at stake. We don't think that circularity should end up by creating proprietary data models that cannot communicate among themselves. Because otherwise, the data that gets lost today well, that part won't change because really we need a common language. We need a way for all of us, governments, consumers, companies, all parts of companies, recycling operators, all the new ones that really still need to be born because this is another area. You know, circularity will also enable new entities to do, to do jobs that we cannot even imagine today. But all this should happen in true and interoperable way. So we understand that there is data that is confidential, that is confidential, the data that cannot be exchanged, but this is why standards were made for. And in GS1, we only focus on the kind of standards that I mentioned before. You will never see a GS1 standard going into one of the other sectors where you have other standardization bodies. And so I guess we are there to support the circularity challenge. And we've been already writing there are some, some documents that you will find on our website. So this is more than what I can share today. Basically, with this document, the circular data for circular economy, we wanted to point out that um, because we heard a lot of discussions about uh, circularity data, well, the most important part is really the interoperability and how to open up data, as Joachim said, he, I, I note down that, that um, sentence at the, at the end of his speech, he said we need to open up this data. 
Absolutely, we need to open up this data in a way that also the data can circulate and be interoperable across different sectors, across different supply chains for all of us to get access to it and benefit from it and, and also to boost, of course, the, the digital part. So another challenge that we see, and, um, and we wrote a document on this one, which is uh, again available on the link that you see on the screen, is the fact that we absolutely need a common ontology because if we really want to make the web standards discuss with the product standards and to enable artificial intelligence machines reading all the data and um, you know using the data in the right way to scale exactly to reach the scale that was mentioned both by the European Commission and the United Nations really we need the data to be structured along a common ontology. And this is a global challenge that we are happy to embrace with W3C and with other organizations. We need to be really all together in order to develop this language. But once we have this common ontology, things can go quicker and quicker uh, regarding the eight challenges that have been shown on the screen by the United Nations in particular. So I hope this message is meaningful also for those who are listening to us. Once we will have a common ontology, it will be possible, there will be a role for everyone involved in the product life cycle in order to share and to receive and to upload data. We are along a sales ground model, it's not just one up, one down now, so you give me your data, I transmit part of it to the next one. Well, no, it, the, the data infrastructure and the data architecture is really different. Every stakeholder will need to play its part because we are all responsible in a way for the data that we manage and the brand owners have really the, the ultimate responsibility of the first birth certificate of the product, which is connected to the product passport concept that the European Commission is developing. So the scale, the, the data architecture that we are thinking about is a decentralized one and I will go in a minute, I'm just conscious about time, for now the GS1 standards can enable this decentralized data architecture. And this is thanks to the GIS1 digital link, which is a new standard, I mean, a relatively new, it was one of the last ones that we approved, which is as simple as that. I know there are a lot of technical people here in this call, but actually it's a revolution and, and, very, and very, in very, very often revolutions are born from very simple things. You include a URL inside the barcode. You know, today the barcode is present on every product around the world, but if you open this up, with a new URL, well, you enable decentralized uh, data to be available for the product passport concept as well. And in this way, you don't need heavy, big, centralized databases that will consume a lot of energy, that will request a lot of data governance and uh, data access rights and data portability rights and so on, which is heavy both in terms of environmental impact, energy impact and human resources. Well, in this way, the data will stay where it belongs to the brand owners, and this will allow this decentralized data system. Yeah, so there are several benefits, and the benefits are also here on the slides, but I guess I already mentioned the most important one. So this is, um, you know, the, the, the slides, of course, will be available for those of you who want to go deeper on how this will be possible. But this, uh, actually, one of the main elements is the fact that the web standards will use uh, the, the standardized language that today has also been used along all supply chains. And this, will, this interaction will be happening through a common ontology that we need all, everybody to develop, but also through a simple URL included into a barcode, which is an open standard, by the way. So this is not a sexy solution that we need to invent. And here, you know, um, you can find another benefit of what um, uh, this digital link included in a, into a barcode will happen. Of course, here we're speaking about 2D carriers, so either it's a data metric or a QR code that will be able to carry the product passport and to point the right stakeholders to the right set of information that the regulators will decide to, to enable. Exactly with this mindset, GS1 in Europe and GS1 Global signed a memorandum of understanding with the Global Battery Alliance because the European Commission issued a regulation on the battery. This was the first sector for us, according to our understanding, where the product passport was included. And so we decided to work with the industry and to find the best way on how to approach uh, the product passport challenge inside with them, and uh, thanks to a partnership that we just signed. For those of you who are also maybe more um, focusing on the garment sector, we've been supporting the UNICEF Sustainable Garment Initiative, 
where the G4 nuclear standards have been really taken into account and described, you know, we've been participating in all the discussions and the guidelines have just been approved by the uh, UNEC. And so we, this is another case. There is also a very, um, a very, another initiative uh, led by G1 Italy in this case, which is focusing on how the barcode could be really used only for the environmental purposes. And uh, this is the barcode for environment project. It's, um, as you can see again, I mentioned the QR code and the data metrics. And in this case, I mean, it can be both RFID or the GIS1 uh, digital link enabling, you know, the data sharing part. Uh, also, there is um, also on the government, the digital link initiative. And then the, here in the slides, I leave the references to several other projects that are enabling the circularity with uh, the GS1, this GS1 open standards. So my main message is that we need to find a way all together in order to enable this common language across all um, supply chains. We know that the European Commission has selected some uh, key important uh, sectors, while the G1 open standards are available in order to make this transition and this change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca. I think uh, what was uh, very good to see is that you already, in reality, are working on a lot of these issues and make them available and usable in practice. And of course, uh, we need exactly the transition from the big policy ideas and vision and the concrete uh, kind of uh, examples like you mentioned for the batteries to, to those uh, concrete people working on the concrete examples on the ground. And I think your, your plea for, for data and a common language is, is well understood, and I can fully support that. Um, we will have a second uh, presentation, which will probably also uh, complement this very concrete uh, uh, use cases and with work that is ongoing in Luxembourg. So I'm very happy that uh, Jérôme Petit is with us. He is a project leader and uh, in, is working in the government of, of the Ministry of Economy in Luxembourg, and he deals there in particular with new technologies and research. And his presentation will exactly look at the, the, the digital circular economy fingerprint for products. So again, coming from the from the uh, digital product passport and the, and the supply chain, and it would be very interesting to hear his uh, presentation now. And as I said, the questions are coming in. That's very good. I'm kept keeping note of them. Uh, keep sending your questions and we will try to answer as many as possible at the end of all the presentations. So if uh, Jérôme is ready, then I would hand over the floor to you for your presentation, please. Thank you, Joachim, and uh, hello to everyone. So very nice to, to speak to you today and also speak after the, this interesting talk uh, from yourself, uh, David, and, uh, and also Francesca. So let me just share my presentation. And go into full screen mode. All right, I hope that everyone can see my screen. And as uh, Joachim just mentioned, I will present you uh, the product circularity data sheet and explaining how that will create a digital circular fingerprint uh, for products. So maybe to, to set the frame, um, we, we were looking at how today uh, data is flowing through the value chain and uh, the graph I'm showing here at the top, you, you already saw it uh, in the presentation. It was taken over by, by William Neal. And uh, we really saw that it's today very difficult to uh, collect valuable information, uh, specifically on, on circular properties of uh, products to enable uh, future circular business models so that products can be recycled, reused, uh, repaired, what what you can imagine as a second life for a product. So the issue is that today it's typically the, the final um, producer or the M who is asking his supplier to get specific information, who is asking his supplier again similar information and so on and so forth. So we are going up upwards the supply chain to get uh, data and in fact it, it's very problematic because it's it's very time consuming, it's expensive uh, you get back several kinds of data. People typically don't understand the same thing when you ask a question or, or use a specific term. So the information is not standardized. And most of the time, uh, suppliers are very reluctant uh, to share information. 
uh, specifically the one they consider as trade secrets or being proprietary. Um, so what we envisage as a solution is the product circularity data sheet. And uh, as you see on the bottom, the PCDS will allow this information to flow directly from the beginning of the supply chain. So we really want to set up a system uh, where you have to provide this information directly when you start manufacturing a base material or a sub-assembly of a product. And so you have this PCDS and I will explain later on, on of what it consists exactly. Um, you provide that information to your customer. He can then integrate all the different PCS information he receives from his suppliers, uh, including the impact of his own process. And he can provide that uh, to his next customer and so on and so forth until we end up at the end product. And that information is made available for a user or specifically, as I mentioned, to enable circular business models to the next user also. And he can go back uh, through the, the specific uh, data platform of the PCDS to ask specific question to get a detailed information on a specific property. So a little bit more details about uh, the PCDS. It started uh, in 2018, uh, where we made that analysis and, and showing that it's very difficult to get the data through the value chain. And we said, okay, we need to, to do something here and we want to establish um, really an internationally recognized industry standard uh, for communicating data on the circular properties of products uh, throughout the value chain. And with that, we hope to save significant time and cost uh, to all the players worldwide. This will also allow um, uh, the, yeah, the emergence of new uh, circular business models and also push uh, circular design of products to make sure uh, they keep um, yeah, in, in, in a circular business as long as possible. Uh, we had already from the beginning more than 50 companies interested to collaborate here, uh, representing uh, more than 12 different countries all over the world. And uh, that initiative has been growing since then and um, taking several steps as you see on the timeline on the bottom so after the demonstration of the real demand uh, we developed a uh, first proof of concept uh, of the pcds and we are now in a phase where we are testing it uh, with different uh, producers together with their supply chain and their customers and in parallel we launched uh, also uh, the edition of a standard uh, at ISO level. So I will speak about that later in the presentation uh, to give you a full detail and an overview of what we are doing at ISO. And the idea also at the Ministry of the Economy in Luxembourg is to set up this year a non-profit uh, governance so that it is no longer handled by the Ministry but really by a non-profit who has the mission to make the PCDS grow uh, and accelerate uh, based on success it uh, receives right now. So I will go now in more details about what the PCS is exactly. So it's a threefold system where we base ourselves on a data template um, where we ask a different question about uh, the circular properties of a product and we base ourselves only on true false statements. And this is very important because that is the solution which uh, we have identified as being uh, the most uh, promising way of um, yeah, making people feel comfortable to share information throughout the value chain. So here, in fact, they are not sharing directly the information, but just answering by yes or no to a specific statement. And mainly saying yes to statement means that the products fulfill that statement. As behind that, there is a standard explaining the different terms, how you have to fill out the PCDS, um, um, and how you have to keep also the proof of that. You, you allow the system to be auditable by a third party verification system. And with that, you create a trustworthiness into the system. So in parallel, we have developed that specific guidance document explaining these different steps and making sure people speak the same language 
and also uh, keep a proof of this information. This leads also to the fact that the system in Fine is a decentralized system because we will only be at the end exchanging PCDSs providing specific statements of the products but not directly the full disclosure of the information. That is then only uh, made upon request, so the third part of the system is creating a standardized uh, data exchange protocol where a final user can specifically on one properties get in touch with the producer or the specific, I would say, counterpart having that information and exchange in a secure way on that property. So as I mentioned before, as there's a standard behind, uh, we are also creating a whole um, assurance mechanism uh, to control the conformity of uh, the different PCDSs. And so this is what we consider as uh, different uh, auditing, possible auditing steps. And uh, one important part for us is that we should allow uh, from the beginning also self-assessment uh, as uh, audit can be very expensive need to have that kind of step to include um, SMEs in the loop but uh, also companies all over the world because what we see today is that uh, a lot of initiatives out there are mainly focusing uh, on countries where products are consumed but less uh, to countries where the products are produced and we need to really englobe everyone in that process and make sure that information flows directly from the beginning of the supply chain, so yeah, all over the world where also products are, are being produced. And then of course we hope that uh, people having already several prerequisites uh, and, and for example different ISO certificates uh, to yeah, ease the, the effort and the burden of an uh, audit process. And then last but not least, uh, we envisage a specific um, data exchange platform which, as I mentioned, the information is kept at the premise of the producer, so it's really a decentralized system, so we really want to be uh, the middleman who is making sure um, uh, that the request which is coming in is a valid request, a secure request, and then uh, going to the specific person who has that answer to make sure he gets the request and provides the necessary information to validate it. Um, with all the initiatives out there, we are also thinking of uh, setting up different APIs to facilitate that information and also optimize it uh, as much as possible. So just to, to show a little bit uh, the awareness we are raising on, on that topic, uh, I think uh, the idea we I have presented uh, shortly um, has, a, has is gaining a lot of interest because of the idea of, of having a decentralized system, uh, not fully sharing information, just working on the statements. So this is addressing a, a lot of, of interesting points also that there's a standard behind it that's also, I think, very important. And therefore we are checking a lot of uh, boxes um, on the evaluation which is going on at the uh, Sustainable Product Initiative uh, for the Digital Product Passport. So there we are uh, on the scrutiny uh, between many other platforms. We are also uh, working on the proof uh, of concept uh, using the notarization use case of the uh, European blockchain service infrastructure. So uh, for the IT platform, uh, we believe that uh, blockchain is, uh, could be a possible solution, but we are not fixed on that but mainly for the audit uh, certificates and audit proofs, uh, we are looking at using that uh, naturalization use case. And then we have different uh, agreements with different platforms out there, uh, just mentioning uh, Quill to Cradle, uh, Products Innovation Institute, uh, and also Madasta. Uh, and we are also in, in very close collaboration uh, with uh, different leaders in, in circular economy or sustainable development uh, and, and have strong support uh, from them uh, to make the product circularity initiative uh, really grow further. As I mentioned in parallel, um, the product circularity data sheet is also taken up as a new work item 
uh, at ISO level. So um, Luxembourg is, is convening working group five uh, and we are the editor of uh, the new ISO 59040, uh, which is uh, put on the, uh, the technical committee 323 about circular economy on the ISO. And uh, yeah, we, are, we started our work just uh, in April this year. We will convene our first uh, editing session uh, on the 20th of July and, and hope for uh, yeah, having a smooth moving on on the different uh, working drafts, committee drafts, and hopefully have a final uh, international open standard out there in 2024. So for us, it was very important uh, to create an open standard and also engaging the international community. We didn't want to create something uh, private and, and closed, uh, as here we really want to englobe uh, the whole world on, on, on that specific topic. And the slide here about uh, the ISO work is also concluding my presentation, so I would be very glad uh, to take some questions afterwards, and uh, I give back the floor to Joachim. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. And I think, uh, as if we had planned it, uh, it was very nicely complementary to uh, to to my my early introduction, and it's exactly the type of uh, concrete developments that we now have to get going. I mean, the ambition is very high that we want to achieve this in the next couple of years. But I think your presentation has shown of the transformative character character that such an initiative can have, uh, far beyond, let's say, uh, the the environment part, but really how we produce and and consume uh, uh, our uh, products and, and therefore really grateful that you shared all these insights. And I think again, um, please keep sending the questions. I'm, I'm, I'm taking note of, of them, but I would like to give uh, the floor to our last so near least speaker so that we get the full uh, presentation. I think we have enough time to, uh, to go through uh, the specific questions. And I'm very delighted that we have uh, now Timo Ruho Meki here from uh, uh, from Helsinki. He's program director, IoT and data forum uh, Virium in Helsinki, and uh, he will present to us some work that they're doing on air quality uh, data monitoring and how how to best use this uh, for reducing uh, pollution, air pollution. I would assume mostly in Helsinki, but maybe also in other parts, uh, other parts that this can be used. So, uh, Timo, I'm very delighted to have you with us, and I give you the floor for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joachim. Yes, and um, I'm also probably not only uh, looking at the uh, product, so to say, but also also a little bit of, of the approach and, and the methods, how, how we get there, and also also because of our background, how, how do we utilize the uh, European Union innovation programs, innovation actions in, in order to complement this work. So uh, starting, of course, from the beginning, who, who we are. So Forum Virium Helsinki is, is an innovation company owned by the city of Helsinki, uh, supporting the key city initiatives. One of those, of course, is, is being uh, carbon neutral by 2035. Uh, but of course, there are also lots of other projects uh, and programs. In, in Forum Virium, we at, at the moment have 36 projects going on, many of them coming from Horizon 2020, ERDF, and, and some of Interreg as well. So uh, at the moment, we have a team of about 60 specialists. Uh, and uh, when looking at the, uh, at the project as an instrument, uh, we of course apply projects that are suitable for the city, but we also try to utilize the project in, in a way that, that it would be complementing the roadmap the city has. So, so mainly uh, the areas that we are working in, of course, is is that, uh, or, or what we look for, is that that we can strengthen the uh, city's ability to utilize new technologies, digitalization, how, to uh, help the companies within the within the city to also use the city as a platform for development, and also in in general, just just uh, being agile in a way that that what are the topics and and themes that we are looking for. And of course, the mayor's vision has a is the most the most uh, functional smart city in the world is is the ultimate goal on on this working. But getting to the actual topic of today, 
So, so we have been talking about the data, we have been talking about the interoperability side um, on, on the circular economy. I think uh, we, we have pretty much the same kind of uh, same kind of questions also in the terms of air quality. And, uh, and of course, the ultimate goal in, in any, any uh, this kind of action is that, that it, uh, how does it change behavior and, and what are the methods for that. In, in general, in Helsinki, we have pretty good air quality, so no, no big problems, but we also have this, this that, that we are using sand and salt in the winter time to keep, keep the streets non-slippery. Non so there, are, there is a period in every, every spring where the air quality can be pretty bad. So uh, starting with a short history of open data. So Helsinki has been promoting uh, open data for over 10 years ago, uh, 10 years already. Uh, it started from, from the basic finding or, or, or treating open data as, as a method. If there is no particular reason to keep data closed, then it should be open by default. It should be published by default and, and, and the city together with the other cities and other public actors uh, have a role in, in making data available. And, and, uh, and it should be noted also that uh, data monetization is, is oftentimes very simplistic and, and there, are, there are a lot of expectations on the monetary value of raw data sets, which basically is, is uh, not too easy and, uh, and, and can be really hard. So, so keeping everything open might be actually uh, working quite nice. So we started about 10 years ago, started with, uh, with the raw data approach. Uh, when we started to open and publish raw data sets uh, soon, visualizations and, and simple apps came out, of course, from developer ecosystem. Uh, as an example, invoice data of the city was made, made public so that, that it was easy to create illustrations how the city is spending money and where it goes to. Uh, then about maybe five years ago, uh, there, there was a lot, lot more effort on, on the 3D city models uh, to creating this kind of, uh, well, 3D visualizations of the built environment and also some semantic attributes on top of that. But of course, nowadays uh, we, are, we are mostly uh, interested in, in looking at, at what the digital twin would mean in the terms of smart city. So, so as an example, uh, what kind of simulations and uh, what kind of analytics could be done on top of the, uh, the uh, uh, visual outlook of the data. So, so what we are not looking for in, in the digital twin is not, not another 3D street view. What we are looking for is, is a tool or platform that can be used for analytics and simulations. So it has a life of its own. Uh, the equality is actually an interesting, um, interesting example of, of a roadmap between projects. So, so uh, we could say, say that, that one key uh, milestone, of course, was the INSPIRE directive in, in uh, 2007, uh, all the requirements that came out. It is actually quite a nice package based on ISO TC211. And, and as an example, it, uh, the requirements for the met metadata also include requirements for data quality definition. So it is not only about that this is, this is about PPM of, of uh, particles, but it is also what kind of particles they are. Then uh, there can be uh, uh, supporting the current activities. Uh, there was a project called Pestado in about, I think, 2012, around that time. Uh, that, as an example, was, was the founding uh, and basics for the air quality monitoring system as it is at the moment. So there was analytical methods how to extrapolate uh, the sen sen sensors around the city in order to be uh, useful uh, to turn this kind of hyperlocal sensor observations into something meaningful on, on the city scale. Uh, then a couple of IoT projects uh, coming from Horizon 2020, Synchronicity was laying out uh, several uh, architectural designs, um, also requirements for the IoT, IoT type of data streams, sensor data stream, streams, and, and did uh, pretty good work on, on that one. In my smart life, again, Horizon 2020 Lighthouse project, uh, it was about IoT platform, but this time also about geospatial context. So, so these are nicely complementing each other uh, and, and also taking, taking the uh, uh, interoperability and, and taking the uh, semantics a little bit step further. Uh, then at the moment uh, in air quality, the main, main activity is in, in the uh, Urban Innovation Action uh, project called HOPE. Uh, as an example, uh, one action there is air quality index number two. So, so it is taking further the work that started in the Pescado project years earlier. But now, now, of course, also uh, utilizing the current methods as an example in, in AI and in machine learning and in 
in uh, uh, high performance computing. And of course, at the moment, we are looking at Horizon Europe, what, what new could come out of that, uh, how, how, what kind of uh, new angles we could draw in, in the topic of air quality, as an example, from the point of health, from, from the point of resilience when, when talking about climate change and climate crisis in, in general, and, and so on. So, so lots of interesting things going on, but this roadmap thinking is, is quite important here. Uh, because you cannot do everything in, in one single project and, and you are not always, of course, in the innovation in innovation project, you shouldn't always be right about what you're doing. You should always always also be, be able to uh, find out ultimately that this is not necessarily the best way to work. So far, that hasn't that many times happened, but it, is, it should be also an option. So um, from the city, city angle, uh, engagement, participation of the citizens are, are highly important aspects. And, and when we are talking about behavioral changing, it starts from here. Uh, on the left side, you can see the data that is gathered from, from the uh, so-called provisional or official uh, air quality sensor stations. So the, uh, these are typically uh, uh, instruments that cost maybe 50,000 euros, 100,000 euros. So, so there can only be a limited number of those. And because air quality is hyperlocal, you would get the different reading if you if you move that sensor station ten meters to to the to the another direction. So so it is uh, it it gives the basics and it was enough to create this air quality index and, and create this this grid of of uh, analytics. But of course uh, there are other aspects as well. Uh, when we look at the right side of the picture, there we have some um, uh, citizen science or, or or citizen sensors together work together with uh, with these officer sensors and you can see that that there is not not too much of, of uh, something that is totally against of, of the uh, situational awareness that we get from the official sensor sites so so this is complementing quite nicely and uh, and of course also we are not only looking at at, at uh, perfect data uh, we, we have to be able to also deal with uh, imperfect data as long as we are aware of how the data is imperfect in a way and of course it, it is not the social aspect is not not uh, uh, shouldn't be uh, under, uh, underestimated uh, when citizens are working together with the officials in order to tackle big 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 pro issues then it is always always easier to engage them in the further steps uh, the second approach that that we have had in, in the data acquisition is that uh, the city as an operator, a smart city as an operator, we of course have public transport networks. So, so what we can do is that, that we can utilize, as an example in this case, we have been utilizing the trams of the city as a platform to create uh, air quality information. And again, uh, the, the idea here is, is uh, to complement these stationary high quality stations so that we could, as an example, understand better how does the built environment and buildings and, and how does crossroads and, and different situations in the traffic affect on, on, on the sensor data. And if you look at the lines that there are when, when the tram has been moving, uh, pretty much all of these, these measurements are changing quite a lot. So, so it just illustrates what is the nature of, of the locality on, in, in this, uh, this issue. So uh, several approaches on how to improve the data acquisition, how to create a be better picture on, on what is the pollution and, and what is the air quality situation in the city. Of course, air quality is just one area where this could be done. It could be also about thermal comfort. It could be about uh, lots of other things, but air quality also has, has a good longitude in uh, good, co good continuity in between different projects. So uh, in, in the uh, whole project, uh, we, we took further the concept that we started in the synchronicity project about a uh, route planner that would be taking account of, of what is the quality of air in, in a certain areas. And also we combined a couple, couple of other angles in there. So, so if you are interested in, in uh, uh, green views, uh, vegetation on your path, on, on your road to work, uh, if you would like to have a quiet path or, or if you would like to have a fresh air path, then uh, you can choose your routes accordingly. And of course, of course, in, in this case, we are mostly mostly talking about <coughs> uh, cycling and, and walking, which is also a um, uh, shift or, or transition that, that we would like to catalyst, get people out of the cars and, and start to walk and, and cycle instead. So, so this uh, 
and this service is is doing doing exactly that so uh, when you when, when you have your road to work you could you could try to find out an alternative way alternative route based on on uh, where it is better and and what is happening in in behind of course this is that that uh, this will also uh, let the citizens to focus on on on, on look around and, and and notice these kind of uh, changes in in their area and also be more active about those and and in many many times especially in the cities especially the green area has been something that is that is not necessarily always taking in account when creating the cities so so that we have a lot of buildings, a lot of concrete, a lot of asphalt, but we don't necessarily have that much of parks or that much of green areas. So so when uh, first of all the people can choose where, where they would like to go, then hopefully this would also be uh, supporting uh, the city to, to also uh, pay attention on, on this uh, path and, and uh, see how we could introduce more green areas, more quiet areas and, and more, also more fresh areas in there <clears throat> but as also as an as an of course uh, as an illustration this is useful for the second one and and of course we would like to like to see more uh, as well about the citizens that what kind of daily decisions they are making in order to um, uh, what kind of steps they are ready to make on, on their daily life um, in order to uh, take uh, in this case not necessarily that much of sustainability except with uh, with of course the fact that this is about uh, walking and, and cycling instead of taking a car. Right. So uh, I'm ending this uh, this presentation with uh, with a couple of key learnings, and hopefully also these are something that would be helpful helpful for you all. If you have any questions about these, then then you could reflect on on these ones. But <clears throat> but as I started with the roadmap of of how several different projects have taken us us here. Uh, it, it is essential and is essential essential to always always know that that innovation take time and resources and it is not only about person months it's also about calendar time that sometimes it is just not the right time yet to to uh, move on on certain things there might be uh, development going on in the city like a physical development going on in in the area that has an impact on on something uh, there might be programs that are coming coming and going and, and there might be some other even political level uh, things. So, so it is always good to have time for the change, of course, even though at the moment we don't have much time yet, yet but still. And, and resources, of course. And so, so one project doesn't do it all. And, and in the innovation actions, it is always good to have a, a clear scope and, and clear definitions on what is needed to be done in this particular project. And internally, as, as an actor who is active in uh, 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 who is linking the city with uh, with the EU innovation project? Of course, it is our job exactly to try to try to map uh, how how to uh, slice the uh, bigger programs and, and bigger development uh, expectations into into the project portfolio. So uh, participation and citizen engagement are ongoing strategic activities. Uh, they are not not like project actions. So you you cannot just like that. Uh, <clears throat> set up a new uh, pool of, of citizens that are participating, it, it would be an ongoing thing. At the moment, we have uh, about over 500 citizens that are active in, in different projects. So, so uh, doing different kind of experiments, providing inputs, testing mobile apps, uh, uh, saying, saying what is needed. But this kind of thing is, is very important, that, that we are not only looking at, at uh, uh, looking the city from the satellite view but we are also also doing it on on the ground level very important um, as, as a key learning also data quality and interoperability need attention um, but but what is very important is that these are not domain specific and and we should be we, we should have more attention also on on the generic data capabilities even even when we are de uh, developing data models and, and so on on, on on a single domain uh, because of course uh, uh, what we look for is is that is not the perfect data, but it is a definition how the data is imperfect, so that it could be used in in a very different ways. Uh, citizen developers need attention too. So so following the uh, famous Amazon principle that that first comes API, then comes the application. 
And uh, in, in our case, we have already seen that, that in, in some certain times when, when the API was opened first, then actually the uh, citizen developers and even professional developers came up with uh, even better uh, products and services that, that we were thinking. And, and of course, we are happy to be wrong in these kind of cases in, in, in a certain times. Uh, good documentation and, and also networking. So in Helsinki, we have a we have concept called Helsinki Life Developers, where we basically engage uh, engage these um, ho uh, both hobbyist and professional developers on on the smart city themes. So so it is it is uh, it it's been an active community and and also very helpful when when there has been a technical development needed in the city. And, and final, last but not least, one thing that in Inspire and, and, and supporting Inspire uh, project on, on the innovation actions has been that uh, uh, that the uh, smart city context has not always been that clear. That, that we have be, we have of course have had uh, clear IoT platform projects, but uh, but those are generic IoT, even industrial IoT, not necessarily smart city IoT. So so we cannot ignore the geospatial context in a data requirements, meaning that when we are creating uh, digital twins, we, we, we have to be aware of, of uh, how, how, that, uh, how that, that new data is related to the geospatial context. As an example of what is a feature it is about. And uh, yeah, uh, that would require attention in the future. But yeah, so uh, stopping here with this one and, and hopefully you, ha you have questions about this, uh, just a generic overview, uh, what we do around or how we build the city uh, on, on, the, uh, on the example of, of uh, air quality monitoring. But yeah, thank you for this one. Thank you very much, Timo. And I think uh, it really completes nicely the, 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 the kind of different dimensions that we have uh, set up uh, when, when starting the session on the circular economy solution. And I, I, heard, uh, I heard about this uh, Example in Helsinki about identifying the um, the green path already, which is really really nice, and now now I understand even better how how advanced you already are. It's fantastic. I wish we have that in Brussels soon. So I think it's it's exactly this type of inspirations that uh, that we want to look for. Um, that could be interesting to to many many others uh, to see how, how it fits within their their context. So wonderful to all the speakers, uh, thank you for their presentation. You have managed an enormous amount uh, of information to pack that into the time. And we have managed to keep on the time. It's really good. I'm really happy to see that um, we have uh, now exactly uh, about 25 minutes or so as planned for questions and answers. And uh, I think that um, we can uh, go through them. I will probably start by grouping them a little bit and then giving them to speakers. And then I will also ask speakers in the end to come into the discussion because some of the issues that have been raised, I think very good points, are of course issues that are not necessarily yes or no questions. There are really discussions that I think we could have uh, with the time permitting. Um, so with the questions that um, came in, there were a few questions in the beginning uh, after my presentation, which I can briefly say a few words uh, about the cost uh, when we speak about costs of uh, achieving zero pollution uh, was one question, but also about the, the, the pollution effects of digitization. So the, basically the, not only the opportunities, but also the, uh, the risks. Um, so on these uh, two parts, uh, I think, first of all, yes, indeed, I think we, we, we need to be very mindful of, of uh, the cost. Of course, when we talk about costs, there is about um, a number of costs. There's, of course, the costs to society, so costs for non-action, and there are the costs for implementing certain uh, actions and, and, uh, and particular initiatives. And as you know, for all specific initiatives that we're coming forward, whether it's legislation or any other type of, um, any other type of uh, initiatives with substantial uh, impact, we are doing a very, very thorough impact assessments and we're doing public consultations, so they're very specific on the on the initiative. But when it comes to costs overall, implementation costs or costs uh, on, on society, I would uh, direct you to the Zero Pollution Action Plan. There is actually a couple of uh, references and figures in there, uh, which could be uh, giving some, uh, some guidance if this is what you were looking for. 
uh, on the pollution of digitization. This is exactly the first chapter in the in the in the in the digital solutions paper. I think what uh, we have done, and we're doing some work uh, still, but certainly more knowledge needs to be gathered that we need to get a better understanding on one hand of the climate and energy impact. We have already quite a good uh, handle, but also there we need further uh, clarity on, on the differences uh, of what the, the, the environmental footprint is. But also when it comes to resource use, water use for cooling, for example, or, or other, other uh, pollution, there is actually uh, only little information out there and we are getting gather, gathering more and more on this. And I think that's one of the points that we've been underlining as well in our agenda for bringing digital and green transition together is uh, to make sure that the, uh, the, the costs, so to say, the, the, the negative impacts of, of digitization are minimized. And I think there's a lot of good work uh, ongoing, for instance, uh, in, into looking into how we can reduce the environmental footprint of data centers. And that's what uh, colleagues in DG Connect are, are working on uh, right now. Uh, there was a second set of questions that I would briefly uh, answer uh, and then come to, to the other speakers. And there was a question that is uh, linked to, uh, the, uh, to how we take vulnerable people into account and whether there's a special action plan and whether we tackle energy poverty in Europe. And I think the Green Deal has been announced in a way that, uh, that it has not only had the environmental dimension, it has, of course, the economic dimension. It is our uh, new growth, growth strategy for Europe. But the Green Deal has also a very strong component, which is called the just transition. And uh, on one hand, we have incorporated in our action plan on zero pollution the, the dimension on how this affects uh, the vulnerable parts of our society. And there are some specific uh, actions actually in there uh, on, on this point. But at the same time, we're working on a number of other initiatives uh, for example, the Commission will come forward as part of its Fit for 55 package with an initiative that is called the Climate Action Social Fund. And that looks into the questions also of energy poverty and how at the European level we can uh, basically make sure uh, that this does not affect uh, the vulnerable parts of society and we can compensate or mitigate some of the, the effects that this uh, certain actions may have. So I think there we are uh, very active. And of course, uh, if you want to know more about this, I think there is uh, a lot of colleagues in the commission working on this that would probably better place to speak about it. But, um, but there is also, when the Fit for 55 package coming out uh, very soon, uh, there's going to be certainly more information available online on, on these questions. Uh, the second set of questions uh, was linked to the uh, global level. So David, I want to bring you in. And uh, the first question that, uh, that I want to pose to you is, um, what do you think and how do you think, and you probably saw it, that we can speed up uh, the action at a global level in a concrete manner? I mean, we have been talking about, you have been introducing your presentation by saying some of these concepts have been around for a long time, but now we are really in a transformative uh, era and a transformative period but what else can we do to make sure that this is not only lip service, but that there's really a, a fundamental shift and that we're doing that at the speed that is needed uh, for, for the challenges ahead of us? Please, David. Thanks very much. Yeah, this is a fundamental question. One, one of the things the Secretary General is doing is creating this idea of a digital cooperation roadmap, right? So a roadmap of the next couple of years about what are the major investments we need to make to really accelerate uh, digitalization and start to address some of these major issues. So within that roadmap process, we've created this, this environmental track, which is called the Coalition for Digital Environmental uh, Sustainability, CODES. And the whole idea is exactly that. How do we begin to accelerate public and private investments to build a digital planet for sustainability? And we're looking at kind of five core areas in terms of acceleration, looking at the data side, the digital infrastructure side, the finance, the energy, and looking at sort of the whole side of consumers and, and, and changing consumer behaviors through digital applications. So this is um, being built right now, this new coalition, that the first step is really to agree on the, on the vision and the values. What's the big vision? What are the big values? And then on a prioritization framework, how do we basically prioritize the main investments that are needed? And then how do we get concrete commitments against those priorities by coalitions of public and private actors? So we're having a conference actually this week on the on the 30th and 1st uh, of June and July, um, where we're, we're taking this vision and values, we're taking these priorities, and we're trying to come up with a very concrete 
operational plan. Like how do we operationalize? Who are the stakeholders? What are the commitments? And how do we begin to monitor and really catalyze this going forward? So we're working on it. It's sort of a it's a it's a global project in the in the process of being uh, formulated. And I think the key thing here is we're really trying to build something from the bottom up. We're really trying to create this this visions and set of values and priorities from all the stakeholders that are involved in the digital economy, so that they own it and so that basically that, that they have a stake in in taking it forward. So that's certainly one of the concrete measures that we're doing right now across the UN to, to really accelerate this digital planet for sustainability. Excellent, thank you, David. I want to move on to Francesca. And uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, there's the use of uh, QR codes and, and analysis of tools. And there was a very specific question uh, about uh, the, the URL codes and QR codes, or URL links and QR codes it can be compromised, uh, and, and in general terms, I mean, the, the QR code is seen like the panacea. Can you say a few words about this, what is necessary to do so that this technology can also basically be maintained and doesn't require uh, too much update on a regular basis? Please, Francesca. Yes, thank you for the question. Actually, it's a standard. So all changes will need to go through the standardization process. And normally the standardization process is a, is a setup one. You know, we have strict rules on how to amend it and how to update it. In a specific case, we will need to understand the sector orientations, which sectors and if there are sectors going in different directions, and then evaluate through the standardization process how to make this possible. But the rules are already available. If you confront the GIS1 website, you will find the, the process, how it happens. And of course, we will rely on the regulator's guidelines on which sectors will need to be maybe empowered first compared to others, because we, we see it from a global perspective from the time being, and we, we see it cross-sectorial. But maybe if there is some guidance on where to start first and how to do it better, this will be really, uh, in a way, facilitating our job. But the rules are well set and clarified already in the spec. So, and I can put the link into the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very good, very clear. And then I want to... Uh, Ask Jerome as a question that probably also others may want to come in, but I want to start with uh, with Jerome about um, about the uh, basically accessibility uh, of of the data. So the question is, it says uh, broad access to data is important, but they should also be intelligible, understandable for consumers, especially. How can we achieve that at global level, at European level? I mean, obviously, when we have a Digital product passport. That's one of the key um, key, key challenges is to to uh, to avoid uh, information overflow. So how can we make this user friendly and understandable, Jerome? Do you have already some experience in that, some views on this? And uh, then afterwards, I will ask uh, colleagues, other colleagues, if they want to come in on the same question. Please, Jerome. Yeah. You, you got Thank yeah, thank you for that information. I think uh, our take on that is that uh, standardization is is very important. So. Having clear terms with clear definitions um, will allow uh, the right information to flow up until the customer, or maybe I would say the step before the customer. Uh, what we are doing is uh, is mainly focused on, on, I would say, more of a B2B level, but uh, that information being standardized, it can be used by any kind of platform or, or other association, and they can aggregate information in a way that it is uh, intelligible for the consumer. Also, what we envisage here with the product circulated data sheet is something which is not specifically linked to one sector, but something which is, I would say, agnostic of the sector. So, of course, some information are, are less important for consumer of specific products than others, and therefore we believe that uh, the consumer or let's say, uh, applications or, or um, associations in between will aggregate uh, the correct information for the consumer. But you can only do that if you have uh, the correct information uh, as a source. 
Thanks, uh, Jerome. Anybody else uh, wants to, to come in on this question from the speakers? So how can we make uh, all this information understandable, intelligible for consumers? And I guess that's not only for the product part, but also when it comes to air quality, what you do in Helsinki. Anybody else wants to come in? Well, I don't think I don't think that's the role of necessarily GS1 or W3C, as as was mentioned. I think it's another, it's a third party that needs to then make sense of that data and transform it into some kind of, uh, into some kind of standard. And that's one of the ideas that uh, Digital with Purpose is trying to do is trying to take all that very complex data and put it into sort of a single uh, digital mark that really helps you know at a very simple level consumers understand the performance. So there's sort of that simple level. Of the of the digital with purpose mark, and then if you want to drill down and look at the individual metrics, you can. But it's it it still offers that very simple snapshot. But I I, I wanted to sort of also uh, ask the question back to you, um, Joachim, about uh, the requirements of contributing to digital product passports. This this was brought up as well. Is it right now a, a mandatory requirement that companies will have to disclose a certain amount of data to the to the product passport, or is it? Is it a voluntary? Uh, is it a voluntary initiative? Yeah, David, you wanted to come to a question. I was asked. I was. I wanted to ask the others uh, in in a minute. But uh, let me first say before I come to this point um, on the question of um, of the uh, user friendliness of the data. I think from my point of view, it's also important that we ask the users themselves because one user may understand the one type of information and the other user not. So I think we need to engage much more, and that's sometimes what we're probably not doing enough, and I'm talking here about, about our, our work, um, is, is really that we, that we ask the users themselves, what is the type of information you want? And for me, the key is also, that is also what, uh, what drives uh, probably uh, potential for new service provisions, for new business ideas, startups, who use all this complex information and provide simple answers, simple, simple tools, simple apps, that really make our lives easy. I don't want to go into a shop and, and research for half an hour each product that I'm uh, that I'm I want to buy. I want to basically with a with a with a click or with with one scan know is it the product that that conforms to my standards to things that I would like to achieve. Has it the quality, the environmental ingredients, so to say, that I want to uh, contribute to? And this is really a huge opportunity, I think, for for others to help achieve such user friendliness. As, as a service provision and, 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 and provide these type of things. So just to finish up on, on that question. Can I add to uh, that, Joachim, can I just add quickly? Sure, sure. I wanted so, to discuss that first a little bit and then, and then come to, to, your, to your question, David. Yeah, I think as you pointed out, I mean, asking the users is essential. I think, I think the other thing we need to be moving towards is kind of you know, uh, sustainability filters. Um, if consumers simply want to only see products and services that, that meet certain standards, they should be able to switch on sustainability filters very easily and then have sort of the filtering sort of do a lot of the heavy lifting. So I think filtering and I think digital nudging are, are the two ways where you can take that complexity and then also simplify it down to enable that consumer to, to find the products and services that, that match their values, certainly. So I think there's a whole, there's a whole range of things we need to be looking at. How do, you, how do you take that digital product passport and then use it on e-commerce platforms for digital nudging. How do you gamify it? You know, how do you how do you create filters around it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I think there's a, this is such a fascinating area, and there's so much work to be done here. I agree. And before moving on to the next question, I just wondered whether anybody else wants to come in from the from the speakers on this question of uh, user friendliness of data, making them intelligible. Any any other views from anybody? Well, maybe if I may, uh, and we have experience sure. some, we have experience in some of the sectors and where also B two C data is being disclosed and put available. Um, what we wanted to say is that the most important part is data identification. Is how you really structure the data at the beginning, how you identify products initially, because when you do this, and if you do this in a common, with a common language in a standardized way, this can enable B2C in a very smooth way, exactly as you were saying, Joachim, not to have consumers spending hours in searching or paying to access an app, which will end up giving you maybe not the information you were looking for, right? Because this, this is a dimension that we need all to be very conscious about. And so I, I, I guess this is 
This really goes back to the first phase where you identify the product characteristics and the goals and the purposes of the product passport. We need to be clear since the beginning what we want to enable with the product passport and to include master data elements for the scope exactly for the purposes that we want to achieve. And then in this way, we can enable different stakeholders access to different parts of the data set, which can be structured in a very, I would say, light way to begin, maybe if needed, and then to start enabling the change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and let me just ask one more question to Timo, since I uh, haven't come back to him on, on his presentation. And then we have a discussion about the uh, about the making data voluntary obligatory. I think it's an important cross-cutting discussion, which I also would like to have. Uh, and I have one final question for everybody. So I can already um, uh, say that we had a very good question, which I thought we could finish off. And you can start thinking about already uh, about the biggest challenge in, in translating this uh, digital circular economy zero pollution ambition into reality at the global or European level. So what is, from what your point of view, the biggest challenge? That will be the final question when we end. But before that, I wanted to ask Timo, um, looking at his, um, at his tools that you're developing where you're comparing data that are officially monitored by the official air quality, quality monitoring stations, with citizens' data and data that are generated by different means, which probably all have different uh, different quality, different uh, confidence range, et cetera. Are you using specific tools to increase the confidence of data of different quality? How do you de deal with data quality in in your work in, in Helsinki when you when you have so many different data sources that you're using for your air quality or other, other assessments that you're doing? Uh, in, and many times it is just based on on statistical methods. So so to basically just ignoring something that is that is hugely uh, beyond the uh, the uh, uh, expected values. But of course of course that is an important part as well. That when we are doing citizen engagement, especially together with the developers, that we can also introduce professional methods on how how the calibration is done. How how do you create a sensor that is that is really. Uh, capable of, of of creating high high quality data, and ac actually that has been very interesting from the developers side to learn more. And and there is also an, it's also an area that that still requires also standardization. But there are there are still there is still work to do. But yeah. Thank you, Timo. And uh, now um, coming back to the question of data, and one of the questions in the chat was, uh, do you think that provision of such data and that was linked to the product passport? Uh, would be made obligatory to make sure everybody participates or can it remain voluntary? And of course, uh, data access and data rights is a very complex complex business. And I think one thing we can say is that uh, at the European level, we uh, recognize that the uh, current situation is not satisfactory. And that is why uh, the uh, European data strategy has set out a very high ambition. I mean, I think uh, what is it's written in there is really the, our reference point that, I mean, open data by default, if possible, and of course there are certain restrictions when it comes to personal data, when it comes to uh, specific uh, economic data that are uh, that are protected by, by law when it comes to sensitive uh, security data. Um, but the principle or the philosophy is, is I think, is clear, and, and we're driving this from the uh, European data strategy in an overarching way. However, when you then translate that into sector by sector and example by example, of course, the devil is in the detail, as we know. And, uh, and of course, uh, this is why that the data strategy has um, not only set out um, the pathway for uh, data space, the European data spaces, but where we are looking at specific cross-cutting legislation, we have a data governance act already proposed and in, in negotiations at the moment, and we're working on a, on a data act uh, to have some, some general rules in place that will particularly look at uh, the question of availability and access and sharing of uh, uh, data that are held by private entities. Yeah, so that will be the focus of an upcoming legislation. And the last point then coming to the product pass passport is of course specifically, if we wanna make the product passport work, we need to put some rules in place or some clarity in place what the situation is. But I don't think a, First of all, that it is possible to say it's all because we have to be really very specific in the specific field. 
and there are some data, I mean, I, I give always the example because it's a logic one for everybody, there are personal data and we cannot simply describe because of the product passcode, the personal data do not fall under GDPR. GDPR is reference points and that's why these data will continue to be protected as they are right now. So to say that, um, this is uh, something that needs to be specified specifically. Sometimes it's not even possible to probably say across the digital product passport, but we have to go into specifically uh, value chains and specific sectors. But more than that, I'm A, not the, the right person to talk about this, but B, it's also something that we are currently doing impact assessment about. So the reason why, why this is, is currently under, under reflection preparation is precisely to look into the consequences and I think you are at the perfect time, whoever is interested in that topic, you are at the perfect time to contribute to that debate. So as I said, it will not be a black and white debate. It will not be all data or none of the data being, uh, being mandatory, but it's really about now getting the balance right and getting the momentum going that we are, that we are achieving the, bon uh, the positive effects for society, uh, economy, and, uh, and well-being in our world overall without compromising on the pitfalls that it may have if we, if we put certain data in, so to say, in the public domain or make them more widely accessible. But this is a topic where people have spent scratching their head for many, many decades, and it's a really complex, also legal topic. So that's why I'm also a bit uh, careful to not uh, be too specific, because as I said, I'm not, not personally myself an expert in, in this field. But it's a very important question. It's a question that also has not only a legal, but a political angle. And so I would be interested to, from the other speakers, we have a few more minutes to hear whether they want to contribute to that debate about voluntary or mandatory data. And then we wrap up the session with our last round with Sweden. Anybody wants to come in on this question of making data mandatorily available or not? Well, I think how. I think you said it exactly. It's going to be a mix. There's going to be you know, some use cases where there's a certain portion of it that's mandatory and a certain portion of it that's voluntary and a certain portion that's, that's obviously uh, uh, private. Uh, as you say, it'll depend on the use case. What, one of the things we're looking at inside UNEP right now is what are the digital public good data sets that might be needed as part of the digital product passports to evaluate sort of performance across the supply chain. So for example, um, global protected areas is, is access to the global database on protected areas, something that digital product passports might need in order to understand the, the, the potential impact in terms of the, you know, the source, the natural resource source of the supply chain vis-a-vis -vis protected areas. And will there be some kind of analysis that could be enabled by having access to that data as part of the digital product passport? So I think if, co if colleagues have views on that, you know, what spatial information might be necessary at a, at a public, at, at a public digital public good level, as part of that digital passport, we'd love to hear from you and, and hear your ideas because we're also in that phase of assessing exactly that and trying to figure out, you know, how can we offer that data? How do we make that data interoperable? And how do we stand up business models to actually pay for digital public good data that is, that is needed as part of this digital product passport concept? Great. Anybody yeah, maybe just one comment. Not the more. Please, please do. Yeah, no, for us, well, I mean, um, what we were thinking about is definitely mandatory because we see that regulators are really enabling the change. So somehow this is needed, really. We need to set the rules very clearly and very transparently. And so I guess, you know, legislation is a good, good way to go, policy strategies and concrete legislation. And also maybe uh, mandatory, but maybe lighter, and then little by little to enable also the digitalization to boost it, and then to have data stages that can really enable the big digital change as well. So because otherwise we see that there is a run, a long run for solutions at the end, at the end of it, while uh, often you know the first part, which is really how do I identify this correctly. Is completely forgotten. So we think that if we start with the mandatory way, but lighter data set attributes to have the good way done, then we can go quicker and faster later on, right? <laughs> this is our, you know, based on the past experience. But now supply chains are circular, so maybe things will be will be different compared to the to the linear ones. Thank you. 
Excellent. So time is running. Uh, it was a very good discussion. Maybe just make a last round. There's, there was another question coming in just to say that about the, the rewarding of these data uh, and uh, when we do this. I'm just concluding this now to simply saying this is exactly the type of things we're also looking into now. I mean, there's again no yes or no answer. I think that's uh, part of the questions that we're currently exploring, at least that's a part of, of the work that we're doing on the topic presented today. Can I finish this wonderful session with a very short round feedback from everybody, from all the speakers? And I will start, so to say, backwards from the speakers, start with Timo and, and Jerome and so on. Is just 15 seconds, maximum 30 seconds, biggest challenge of what you think is to make this happen, what we are discussing in the last two hours. Timo, what do you think is the biggest challenge? I think the biggest challenge, especially on those topics that we studied as an as a innovation project, is to scale up. So, so how 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 do we go to the industrial level in a, in a very short time? It it actually affects on, on quite a many of topics that that we are working on. Excellent, thank you, Jérôme. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, ju just to say my take on the question before, I would be more in favor of voluntary data. But I think uh, to to open up that discussion again would take uh, uh, too much uh, too long for that. But. Uh, for us, the biggest challenge, I would not like to, to enter in the different challenge of the pieces itself. Uh, we are seeing some success, so we, we are pushing forward to accelerate, but I think the other real challenge uh, in the world out there for the companies really to make that switch of mind to, to go away from a linear economy and to really embrace circular economy. And so to really decouple, uh, I would say, revenues from hyper-consumption and go back uh, to revenues from other business models. So companies are still really struggling with that, and, and that will be still uh, one of the biggest challenges, I guess, to, to change that. Thank you very much, Jérôme. Uh, Francesca. Please. Yes, thank you. I would, say, I would say that the biggest challenge for us is really to include all the right stakeholders at the right time to do to, to make this happening at the scale that, that is needed, but embarking all the right stakeholders at the right time for them to form an opinion and to share the data that they have and so on. So somehow in the process, we see maybe a barrier there. Thank you. Great, thank you. David, please. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's. I think what Francesca said is exactly right. It's. A, it's how do we how do we scale human trust and human collaboration to the global level. Uh, that's a fundamental issue. I think that's the biggest issue <laughs> in addition to the technological ones we've been talking about is just this human collaboration question. I think at a technical level, the biggest challenge is, is this interoperability question and making sure that all these proof of concepts um, start to interoperate so they can scale and we create this sort of broader digital ecosystem of solutions. So it's not going to be one solution that rules them all, but it's, you know, it's this ecosystem of solutions and how do we begin to sort of build that up progressively. Excellent. I think there's hardly anything I can I can add to this, but I think the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity of what we've been discussing this afternoon is that we're doing this together and taking everybody along. I think there's wonderful opportunities here, but we really have to have more of these discussions that we had this afternoon uh, to, to, to inspire and excite a lot of people about this and taking everybody along. And I think today was only about inspiration, about an appetizer in this, and we hope uh, all of those listening have had enough insight in, uh, in, in these topics that we are working on to find out more, to get involved in the debate and to, dare, to do their part in this wonderful journey. I don't want to close the session without uh, reminding you that the Connect University will continue. Uh, so we have the next session, if I'm, uh, if I'm uh, right, it's uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock. It's a session on e-mobility for sustainability and competitiveness. And then with that, and apologies for slightly running over time, I think we're done. I would like to thank the speakers again. It was fantastic. We covered an enormous amount of uh, uh, terrain in this uh, two hours. And I hope it was good for all those watching to get an insight of what is, is going on at the moment in these various topics on digital solutions for zero pollution and circular economy. Andrea, is there anything else we need to do before we close? Thank you once again to, to all of you, and we look forward to, to welcoming you tomorrow to, to the next session. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.